Our scripture reading this morning comes from 3 John. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Let's pray. Father, we see the example set forth for us in the Bible of people that go out and they proclaim your name for the sake of your name. And they do it in a world that doesn't know you that doesn't love you, is hostile toward you, and that's the world we live in today, Father. And God, I pray that we will be obedient to your calling. You have called us over and over to proclaim your gospel. And in order to do that, we must know your gospel. It must live within our hearts, and so we can share it with the world who needs it so desperately. God, we we do these things in your name, because there's no other name. The name above all names. God, the name that the Lamb of God who sacrificed for our sins, Lord, who came to be born just to die. God, we are so grateful for that. I think I pray that we will just remember that, that that will just dwell inside us so we can anchor ourselves to you. I pray you'll be with Pastor Jeremy as he preaches today. God, um, open our hearts to receive the truth, the only truth there is. In your name I pray, amen. Kids, you are dismissed to kids' worship. church. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, we're going to look at verses 13 through 15. As you're turning there, many of you have probably heard about a missionary named Elizabeth Elliot. She was married to another missionary named Jim Elliot. In 1956, Jim, along with four or five other missionaries, uh, were speared to death as they went to reach uh, an unreached tribe with the gospel. So he was speared to death, along with five others. And then later, Elizabeth and her daughter, Valerie, went back and ministered and presented the gospel to the people that had speared her husband and Valerie's father. Elizabeth Elliot, if you've never read about her, you should. Uh, She lived from 1926 to 2015. It's pretty incredible, her life story. And this is what she wrote. The deepest things that I have learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters are the hottest fires, and the hottest fires have come the deepest things that I know about God. Elizabeth Elliot was an incredible and faithful servant of the Lord. And I know people hear stories like this, and they say things like, well, Pastor, that's incredible. But I'm not called to that. I'm not called to go and and reach an unreached people group. That's okay. Some of you are called to living in a jungle or reaching an unreached people group. Some of you are and some of you are not. I think the bigger question this morning is this. 
If you're not called to that, then what are you called to? What are you called to? You see, our hope, our goal here at New Union is to help the people of God fulfill the mission of God. It is to help believers understand that there is a mission of God that we need to fulfill. And so if you're here this morning and you're asking, well, what is this mission of God that we as believers are supposed to be committed to? Well, you just saw a bumper about it, a sermon bumper, but it comes from Matthew 28. Listen to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. That word go is an active word. As you are going, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The great commission, the commission that we have, the mission that we have as believers is to go and tell the world the good news. The good news that despite our sins, despite our hopelessness, despite our brokenness, through repentance and faith in Jesus, we can be forgiven. You see, the fact is this, church, this world needs to hear the good news. This world needs to hear that there there is hope to the hopeless. There are so many in this world who are broken and desperate and depraved. And they're swimming in sin, shark-infested waters. They're swimming there with a dangerous place with, with the end of life coming. And they need to know about Jesus. They need to be saved. They need to be redeemed. They need to be forgiven. And that's our job is proclaim the good news to this lost and dying and desperate world. That is our mission. So whether it's in the jungles or reaching unreached people group or, or, or even here, staying here, we have a mission. And if your call is not to go to reach an unreached people group, then what are you called to this morning? And so this sermon series, Burdened, will be reminding us that the people of God are called to fulfill the mission of God. And so this sermon is going to be talking about what it means to be a sending church. What does it look like for us to send missionaries and support missionaries? Next week, we're going to talk about what it means if you're called to stay. If you're called to stay. So today, we're going to talk about being burdened and sending people to reach every nation and every tongue and every tribe. And next week in this burden series, we're going to talk about what it means to stay and fulfill the Great Commission for the glory of God. But either way, whether you're going or staying, you have a commission, you have a mission to go and make disciples. And how are you committed to that mission this morning? How are you committed to the mission? You're sitting here today because someone shared the good news with you. That's why. Who are you sharing it with? Who are you burdened for? Look at Romans chapter 10, 13 through 15. Listen to what verse 13 says. This is a verse of scripture that after you read, you can take a deep breath. It should give you a lot of peace. Okay? For everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody can breathe now. Because if you have called on the name of the Lord, you are saved. How beautiful is that? That despite our wickedness, despite our sin, despite our brokenness, that through Jesus we are saved. Because we called on the name of the one who gave his life, shed his blood so that we could be redeemed. If it's beautiful to you, it is also beautiful to the hopeless in this world. It's beautiful. In the context of this verse, these verses, it's going to talk about sending people out and people going to make disciples. And these people that were going to make disciples, they were sweaty and dirty and probably smelled. But Paul calls them beautiful because it is beautiful to share the good news. It's a beautiful thing. It was beautiful to you when you saw the amazing grace of God for the first time. 
And it is beautiful when we share the amazing grace of God to this world that desperately needs to hear it. So this is the church's call to be these beautiful feet we're about to read about, to be the people who share this good news that for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is our responsibility and this is our call. Let's, let's look here at verse 14 and 15. It says, this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How's people going to be saved if they've never heard about Jesus? And how are they to hear, verse 14, without someone preaching? How are they to hear the good news if believers are not committed to the mission of God to share the good news to this world? Verse 15, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? Sent, saved, baptized, baptized, equipped, and sent. You see, that's God's plan. That's his plan A, that we as a church are to tell people about the Lord. They are to be saved. They are to be baptized. They are to be instructed and taught the things of the Lord. And then they are to be sent out. It is the job of the church to send out, to disciple, and to teach all that God has commanded us. This is God's plan. This is the commission of the church. Listen to what it says. As it is written, how beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful it is for us to be, get to be a part of the mission of God. To offer hope to the hopeless. So point one is this, the church's responsibility, number one, is to commit to proclaiming the gospel and equipping others to share the gospel. This is not something that we put off. People are dying, they are lost, and they are going to hell. Hear that. People, and who are these people? And they are your children. They are your grandchildren. They are your neighbors, your co-workers, and your friends. There are also billions of people throughout this world that are lost. Church, that should break us. It should break us. It's eternal life that we sing about, that we look forward to with no more heartaches and no more pain and no more suffering, being with God forever. There's people that don't know that freedom. They don't know that peace. And that should burden us. This morning, we, we baptized a young lady in her 20s, baptized a 10, 11-year-old girl and my 8-year-old son. You know how many girls in their 20s 11-year-old girls and 8-year-old boys all over this world that don't know Christ. That need to hear the good news from people who are operating with urgency and sincerity and truly burdened for their souls and for their eternity. We're called to be these people to share this news Elizabeth Elliot, talking about this, she said this. Don't get in touch with your feelings. Don't you love her candor? Like, you know, you can take it from her. Her husband got speared to death. She went and reached the people that speared him. Like, you got to listen to this, right? She says, don't get in touch with your feelings. I'm sure her feelings weren't great about this. Right? She said, submit radically to God and do what is right no matter what. Put your love life on the altar and keep it there until God takes it off. Suffering is normal. Have you no scars, no wounds with Jesus on the Calvary road? I mean, that is powerful. As we die to ourselves and follow Jesus, shouldn't we have scars and shouldn't we have wounds on this Calvary road? 
Shouldn't we be people who proclaim the goodness of God? Shouldn't we be people who suffer for the glory of God, for what he's done for us, knowing that we have a home and eternity with him? We have to commit, church, to proclaiming the gospel and equipping others to share the gospel. We need to be teaching our children what it means to have a burden for the lost. We ought to be shouting out names to God as a family, calling out to God and sharing with God the names that we want to be saved. It ought to keep us up at night that people don't know Christ. And so I would challenge you to pray for people who are lost, to have your family pray for specific names that are lost. I would challenge you to share the gospel with urgency. I'll never forget talking to this college student And she said that uh, she played on a basketball team. And on this basketball team, she was a Christian, but there was a girl on the team that was an atheist. And she said it always intimidated her. This Christian young lady was always intimidated by this girl who was an atheist. And so she said, I kind of avoided her. She said, I was always nice and I was always pleasant around her, but I always avoided her. And at the end of the year, the young lady came up to her and said, do you like me? And she goes, yeah, I do. And she goes, well, why don't you ever associate with me or talk with me? And why do you, I feel like you always avoid me. And the young lady said, well, if I'm honest, I just didn't think you'd like me because I'm a Christian. And she goes, so you didn't talk to me because I'm not a Christian. She says, young lady, when she said it like that, she kind of felt the, the burden of it. And the atheist girl looked at her and said, well, in, in your gospel, in your belief, I'm, I'm on my way to hell. A Christian lady, Christian college student said, yeah. And she said, but you didn't love me enough to tell me that. And church, I think it's a real question. Forget your insecurities. Do you love people enough to tell them the gospel? Because we have a mission to share the love of Jesus with a world that desperately needs him. Amen. And we are called to commit to this. One day we will stand before the Lord. And I hope it won't be with a life that was wasted or not committed to the mission. Jesus is more worthy than that. That blood we just sung about that, that washes our sins, that we, we, we shout about, we sing about, and, and we praise God for. Shouldn't that same blood, that opportunity to be covered by the blood of Jesus, be proclaimed to this lost world? Shouldn't it? We have a mission. So the takeaway is this for point one. Proclaim the good news with urgency. Proclaim the good news with urgency. Teach your children. Disciple others to proclaim the gospel. Proclaim it. Look for ways to share it. I don't necessarily need you at Food City with a megaphone. Okay? I need you inviting your neighbors to your house for a meal and telling them who Jesus is in your life. That's what we need. Point two. Not only to be, are we to be committing to proclaiming the gospel, we need to be committing to being a sending church or to sending missionaries. Revelation 5.9 says this, And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Church, we want every tribe and language and people and nation to know Jesus. We want everybody in Ray County to know Jesus. We want everybody in the state of Tennessee to know Jesus. We want everybody in North America to know Jesus. We want everybody in this whole world to know Jesus. And we should be burdened for it. Because we don't want anyone to enter damnation. Anyone. We were part of the Southern Baptist Convention. And so between NAM, which is the North American Mission Board, and IMB, which is the International Mission Board, 
we help support over 9,000 missionaries. Church, pray for them. If you open up your bulletin, you'll see a young lady's name, a woman's name named Kay Bennett. We are to pray for her this week. You'll see her picture up on these slides before church. We are to pray for them. That's why we put them there. So there will be people who cry out for these missionaries to ask God to use them in a mighty way. Not only do we have these 9,000 missionaries to support and to encourage and to pray for, but we also have those that are in our church that we're sending out. We've got those in our church. We've got a young man in our church who's going with IMB soon. We pray for him. We support him. We encourage him. We've got a family in Indonesia. We support the family and we pray for them and care for them. We send them. We've got others scattered throughout this world or throughout in this state of Tennessee and, and, and North America. We've got others who are meeting with Donald who feel called to mission, who are going on mission trips and looking for where God's going to send them. And church, I have been praying for our church for a long time that God would raise up those who are committed to ministry and missions. And I pray that God will use us in that way to be a sending church. But we have to be supporting them and sending them and encouraging them and praying for them and never forgetting about them. Ever. Because this beautiful work that they're doing, the beautiful feet that are walking that path, we support and send and encourage church. Let's be burdened for them. Let's ask God to raise up families in our church and send out missionaries in our church. Let's care about every nation coming to know Christ. And so takeaway number two, let's allow God to send our families and us. Let's allow God to send our families and even us. Let's allow it. Let's be faithful to the call. To the mission. Point three. Not only we are called to commit to proclaiming the gospel and sending people to proclaim the gospel. Point three, we are called to commit in supporting missionaries and supporting them. When you give to New Union, you are supporting missions. I'm so thankful for your faithful stewardship. We give to the cooperative program, IMB and NAM. We give to Lottie Moon, and 100% of what we give goes to those missionaries that are in Lottie Moon. We give to Annie Armstrong, which goes to North American Mission Board. We send groups on mission trips. We support missionaries in our churches. We support church plants, and we have helped build orphanages and, and wells and, and built chicken homes and, and helped homes and villages. And We have proclaimed the gospel all over this world. Praise the Lord, but we're not finished. It's not finished until the Lord comes back. We have to continue to support. So what else can you do? You can pray. You can support these missionaries by praying for them. You can write to them. Recently, the Phillips family, man, they, they, they wrote us an email. And they talked about a family in our church who, who wrote them. Talked about a teenage boy who, who wrote and, and encouraged their children by a letter. Why did that encourage them? Because they feel supported. They feel cared for. They, they, they feel remembered. Sometimes it's just good to go see a missionary. We don't have to have this grand story about how we totally proclaim the gospel to everyone there. Maybe we just need to go for a couple of days and see a missionary and encourage them. Maybe they're in a place where English is not the language that is being spoken and they just want to talk with you and have coffee. You ever had a rough day at work? You ever had a rough month and somebody, one of your friends, takes you out for coffee and you go, that was nice. Can you imagine missionaries? Could you imagine? Sometimes in supporting them, we just need to go see them. We just need to email them and write them and tell them we love them and we're praying for them and even FaceTime them. Because we're called to support them and encourage them to be a part of the work that they're doing. Church, this is our call as a church. To be burdened, to be a sending church, to be a supporting church, to be an encouraging church, to be committed to proclaiming the gospel to this lost and dying world. So the takeaway, point three is this, support missionaries regularly. Support them. Encourage those who are called to it. As we're all called to be a part of this mission. 
pray that God would raise up more committed to missions here. You would probably be surprised at the number here that has told us that they feel called to missions that we're meeting with. It's incredible what the Lord's doing. We get to be a part of it. So this sermon was about sending and supporting. Next week is about staying. What our responsibilities are in staying. So here's how I want to end this sermon. I want you to answer these questions. And these questions are not to make you feel bad. I hope these these questions will encourage you. But I want you to answer these questions and gauge your commitment to the mission. Gauge your commitment to the mission of God, the glory of God. Here you go. First question. Who are you burdened for? Who are you burdened for? Question two. Who are you proclaiming the gospel to? Who are you proclaiming the gospel to? Number three. Who are you regularly praying for? Who are you praying for? Number four, who are you discipling that they grow in their faith? Who are you discipling? Next question, who are you supporting? It's a missionary, emailing, emailing, encouraging. Last question. What scars and sacrifices do you have on this journey of dying to yourself? This journey of of committing to the mission, dying to yourself, following Jesus, proclaiming his gospel. What scars and sacrifices do you have? I think you have to be the gauge of your commitment to this mission. So answer these questions. If you say, well, pastor, I'm doing really well. Praise the Lord. You're not finished. You're not finished. If you say, pastor, I, I probably need to get in, get in the fight. I need to be committed to the mission. And guess what? It's not too late. There's many out there that need to hear the good news. There's many missionaries that need to be encouraged. So I'm going to invite you to come pray for missionaries. Pray that God would allow us to to reap a harvest. Pray that God would give you a burden. Pray for loss to be saved. Pray for your neighbors and co-workers to come and know Christ. Let's be people who cry out to God this morning. Let's be people who are committed to the mission. The mission is clear. Go and make disciples. And I am so thankful that we get to be a part of this mission. Let's pray. God, thank you for redemption and love. Thank you for salvation. God, I pray that we, as a body of believers, will continue to be committed to the mission of God for the glory of God. God, we pray for missionaries all over this world. We pray for the ones that you're raising up in this church, that we will encourage them and support them. We pray for those in North America. We pray for those on the International Mission Board. We pray, God, that they will feel encouraged and loved and that they will, their beautiful feet will, will, will reap much harvest. God, help us to truly care about lost being saved. Help us in this short little life we have to live a life, a legacy, to, li- to live a life for eternal significance, to leave a legacy that's committed to you. God, help us this morning. Help us to care about things you care about. Help us to care about people's souls and eternity. God, help the people know that this altar is open and this is a place for us as people of God to cry out to you and to pray for others. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. May we be faithful to the mission. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This altar is open.